All right, welcome into another episode of Agency Journey. This is Gray McKenzie, and this week I've got the pleasure of bringing on Amber Chemis, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Revenue River. Amber, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Gray. I'm excited to dig into the story. Will you give us, we'll start with kind of the overview of what your role looks like today and who and what Revenue River is. Yeah, so I am the CEO of Revenue River, which uh, I've, I've been in the agency world for about eight years, but at this agency for the past year, a little over a year. Um, I It's funny because I, I feel like I've worn an operations hat for probably the last three to five years, but finally got the title to match it. So now people take me a little bit seriously, more seriously when I tell them how to run process and, and things like that. Um, but my my day to day is really helping our team. It's a lot of removing hurdles um, and helping to ultimately um, make processes move more efficiently, um, ensuring that our agency is, is running profitably. And again, like to get a very profitable agency, you have to remove hurdles all along the way. So uh, a lot of process engineering and measuring data and making decisions based on that data. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's, um, if you can give us a quick overview. So we were coming up in the HubSpot ecosystem around the same time as Revenue River. Uh, mm -hmm. way back, we joined the HubSpot Partner Program in 2012, uh, 2013, either 2012 or 2013. I think 2012 was the first year going to... Um, to inbound and it was either that year or 2013 that I first met Eric and of course Eric's been on Eric Pratt um, founder at Revenue River um, has been on the podcast before but can you give us an overview of kind of team size obviously um, primary services have things shifted significantly from being kind of a traditional HubSpot agency what does that look like today? Yeah well I think the HubSpot agency world has shifted quite a bit um, I, I would say it used to be all about inbound marketing, building out digital inbound marketing campaigns and sort of helping clients create the content and things they need um, to drive goals forward. We were, you know, their, their marketing agency. Uh, and that was the case for a lot of, of HubSpot agencies, but for Revenue River, and I think a lot of agencies as well, the shift has, has very much become on the technical side of HubSpot and helping clients to integrate different technologies, um, ultimately figure out how to better optimize their HubSpot and get more ROI out of it. And, and a lot of times they're handling the marketing aspect of it. We still support clients on a marketing side of things. And we have clients where we're supporting them on a 12 month plus um, retainer and doing sort of full service digital um, paid media, SEO, things like that. But our, our big um, growth and revenue this last year or two has really become on RevOps, helping clients to stand up HubSpot for the first time and really actually um, even supporting some of the HubSpot onboardings that HubSpot used to do themselves, we're now doing for, for our clients and for HubSpot customers. Makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of teams that have shifted in that direction. Um, and also a number of uh, agencies that have grown really quickly in that ecosystem too. Yeah. Has that shifted... Uh, the way that you engage with clients where like, are you starting with a discovery project or are you going straight into a retainer with most clients? Yeah, it depends on what, what their scenario is. Um, so there are a lot of clients that we will work in a discovery basis and, and support them on standing up their HubSpot, but not actually even work with them on going in a retainer. Um, vice versa. There might be clients. Um, I just, we just had a client kickoff in the last couple of weeks that, they already were on HubSpot doing a great job, but they needed help on the marketing side of things. So we went into discovery and a long-term retainer. Um, but I would say our sales team does a great job of doing enough deep diving ahead of time so that we don't have to have that discovery, resell the client and have a gap, and then work on a retainer. We go straight into the retainer. Um, and then on the project side of things, it is jumping into a project where we might not work with that client ongoing. Makes sense. I want to, there's a ton of questions I could ask kind of as a follow up there, but I want to talk about your story a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, was Smartbug your first move into the agency space? 
It was. And I, I said, I was never going to work for an agency. Um, and the reason I, I said that was because I was the director of marketing and had hired multiple HubSpot agencies to support us. And they kept coming up short. Um, I just never walked away feeling like this is a great partner. And, uh, but at the same time, lived in North Dakota and decided to make this career out of HubSpot and my experience there. Um, and I needed to find a remote company. And lo and behold, Smartbug was uh, that remote company. And it was an agency. So I was a little bit resistant, um, but jumped into the agency world there. And I don't know if I could ever go back. Yeah. Yeah. Why was that such a good fit? I, I think it was a good fit because I immediately was challenged in and understood like both two things about Revenue River and Smartbug that I appreciate about, about both companies is that they really do care about the client and solving for the client. And I immediately was challenged and also in that challenge realized that this company does care a lot about getting the customer's experience right where I didn't feel that from my other agencies that I'd worked with. Hmm, That makes sense. Um, What was the transition like going? So you can walk us through, I think you were um, kind of in a leadership role in the client services team at Smartbug for a while. And then the transition to Revenue River, I think started, were you similarly in a client services role and then into operations? Maybe walk us through that journey. And I'd love to hear, you'd mentioned kind of feeling like you were in operations for a long time. So how do you draw that distinct, that distinction? And what is that? kind of evolution for you looked like? Yeah, I was, um, I would say in, in both companies, I've, I've been heavily in client services. We never had an operations team at Smartbug actually. So, um, when it came to defining process, measuring profitability as the head of client services and, um, and really a, a good chunk of our, our, our revenue, I, I was responsible for that. The, the buck kind of stopped with me on, on those operational responsibilities. Um, and then when I pivoted over to Revenue River, um, different title, but still had sort of the same type of people reporting up to me um, and was very much brought on and to be responsible for really shape, shaping the way that our clients' services, look, what they looked like, how we measured profitability, how we, how ultimately what our, our process and system looked like in serving our clients. Makes sense. From the COO role today, <clears throat> if you had to break down kind of where your time goes in a week, I'm sure it's split in a bunch of different areas, but what are the three or four kind of main functions or main areas where you're investing your time? Yeah, I think, um, I never want to lose touch with with what our customers and our clients need um, because I think when companies and people in operations become too far removed from the customer, they start to make decisions that aren't the best of, of a client. Um, so I spend a lot of time listening in on client calls, um, talking to our customers, maybe more so than most operational people do. Um, and, and, and based on that, get to inform and decide on what kind of service areas do we need to redefine how we go about delivering this? And what does that look like? And I'm working all the way from helping our sales team decide what goes into their contracts to the point of how do we define that in our project management system so that ultimately what we sold and what we're executing on are very one-to-one and match up. Um, and then and then there's the back end side of it. It's It's how are we doing and delivering those things are we effective at it? Of course, I have a team of awesome people who um, signal to me when things are off track. I'm not in our data every day, all day, um, but I have a great team who will signal to me and, and great systems in place where I where they can tell me, hey, this is getting off track. I think it's a bigger problem than just a one-off. What can, what what do we need to do? So again, I, I'm, I jump in in those situations and I'm removing the hurdle. Yeah, that makes sense. What is that? Um, to put a little bit more... Uh, meat on the bones around what that looks like as things are being flagged to you. Is that coming from like an account manager saying, Hey, this client's frustrated with like, are they flagging that? Or do you have symptoms that you're specifically looking for? Like what are the things that would indicate here's an area where Amber has to jump back in? <laughs> I would say there's a couple of different areas. One account managers definitely are some of the most vocal people in, in any agency. I think they're our customer advocates. So they will signal to me when something feels broken. Um, 
I have a strong marketing background as well. Like my, my roots are in marketing. So I also am looking for things like, Hey, are we staying up to date on our marketing practices or our, or, or our rev ops practices? And so I'll talk to the team and they'll give me indicators that, Hey, this isn't on track or uh, it, this isn't where it should be. Um, but then I would say the, the most key thing is that um, I have a director of operations who's really awesome. And he has an entire data set of profitability measures like utilization, effective bill rate, um, on, on track, off track timelines and budgets. So I can see at any given point in time, here's a set of projects that are, are delayed. So for example, just to give you a super concrete example, I'm, I'm going to pick on our web team and they're going to hate me later for this. But um, if there is a cog in the, in the process of website redesigns, for example, we were short development resources for a little while. I quickly could see that because I could see that we had a stack of dev pro projects stuck in our development pipeline or that phase of the project. I can quickly jump in, try to figure out what we can solve there, bring in more resources if needed. But um, it, it, I'm able to see really quickly when anything gets sort of a cog in the, in the system. That makes sense. What's the biggest challenge with measuring profitability? <laughs> oh, there's so many challenges. The biggest one for us, it's, we have different types of of engagements. So there's the retainer side of things as well as a project. And so one thing I've learned in operations and in living in sort of both worlds is you can't measure the, the both, both the same. You have to look at them very differently. Um, and so I would say the, the biggest thing in, in measuring it effectively is, is that's common to both of those. It's probably you're relying a lot on humans and he, and humans are, prone to error. Um, they're not always great at tracking their time. And time data is a big aspect of, of determining if you're, not if you're profitable at the bottom line necessarily, but if you are profitable on particular projects or deliverables. Um, that's the struggle that feels like every agency uh, runs into is like, how do we get this time data back out? I'm assuming the bulk of Revenue River team, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming most of them are salaried, not hourly um, team members. Yeah. But what you're looking at, I'm assuming in terms of profitability is you're probably trying to see profitability by client um, and by service line or by area of the business. It sounds like maybe by engagement type as well, whether something's a project versus a retainer. I do think there's a element where not all revenue is created completely equally. You know, the revenue that you know you're going to have coming in on a monthly basis. Um, and this was a nuance that I didn't realize early on, but uh, where folks want to have a slightly high, in a lot of cases, want to have a slightly higher profit margin on project-based work where it's in and out and back and forth versus um, retainer work. I think most agencies go way too far with that and their retainers are hardly profitable and, and projects are, are wildly profitable. Um, but then also looking at, at profitability and on a team member by team member, you know, like, hey, does this role make sense? What can we, how, how do we grow uh, this role or this area? Um as you're managing all that, what are some of the key tools in the tech stack that you guys are leaning on to, to pull that data out? Yeah, good question. Um, so we use actually a combination of Airtable um, for a lot of our, our, it's a little bit manual, but reporting back on, on key data. Um, and it's sort of like my big picture view of, of how our projects are doing overall. Um, but all of the information that's fed into there, we're using teamwork. Um, and I would be lying if I didn't say that we use good old spreadsheets to pull some of the data out of all of those systems, bring them together. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a spreadsheet nerd, so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable and okay with building a pivot table. I get excited when I get to build a pivot table. Um, and so we, we do rely heavily on sort of when we're running that analysis, and it's not like on a daily basis or a weekly basis, but on a monthly, quarterly, when we crunch numbers and we need to break down that data in a couple different ways by people, by line, service line, for example, we're working in spreadsheets. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to switch gears to a couple different places here. Um, mm -hmm. First one is around hiring. How deeply tied in are you into the recruiting and hiring and staffing um, side of things right now? Well, um, a lot. Uh, I, I, 
we actually don't have a full recruiting hiring team. Um, and so there's certain parts of the business that I'm a little bit more involved, but, um, when I came on board, one of the things that first things I did was evaluate what our hiring processes looked like, where there was improvement. Um, and more recently have just been actually focused heavily on the great resignation. Uh, the thing we've all been, been maybe experiencing already or looking forward to, I mean, in an agent agency world is, is, high stress. There's no denying that any an agency is going to be a more stressful environment. So I think uh, as an agency, we're most prone to the, the effects of the great resignation and a lot of people looking at new jobs in the next year. And so I've been heavily involved in hiring, recruiting, and more importantly, retention, just because of trying to ensure that we keep talent um, and so that I have less talent to go find in the future. That makes sense. Uh, I'm assuming right now you have openings. What's the, we'll make sure we put this in the show notes as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Is there a good careers page on the Revenue River site to point people towards? Yeah, we have a, um, I don't know the domain off the top of my head, but we have a careers page. Um, It's got constantly fed with openings. I would say our HubSpot roles are most, are are most um, not vacant, but most open because it's the highest growth area of our business. Um, But we're also, continuing to look for digital project managers, um, as well as, as a uh, girl strategist, which is basically our digital marketer. I just searched it here. Uh, so it's a hard URL to remember revenue river.co slash careers would be the, would be the URL. We'll put it in there. Um, you. but you have a job here, digital project manager, uh, dash systems automation, which sounds similar to a role that we're hiring for, which is kind of a workflow automation specialist. Um, Obviously we help a lot of agencies streamline their ops and click up and kind of the next evolution for a lot of agencies like, Hey, we got to get the groundwork in place to be really successful to measure profitability to, you know, to operate as efficiently as we can. And the next step of that engagement, I think a lot of agencies flip this the wrong way and try to automate first versus uh, build the right system first and run it. Um, So I love this role that you've got kind of spec'd out here um, as well. There's a whole bunch of automation once you've got a system that's working well that can happen in a lot of these roles, which is awesome. Yeah, and, and that particular role is actually, um, what we've learned about digital project managers is they either love the really technical side of things or they want to be on the creative side of things. And so um, we started to specify in hiring for that role, hey, upfront, you need to know you're going to be a part of some really technical automated types of projects versus the creative website redesign side of things. We like to differentiate it because we don't want people to, to sign up and, and get the wrong interpretation simply because we are a digital marketing agency. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The other question I had for you that I want to run by you was around someone who's earlier in their career trying to follow a, you know, a different path. I don't know how many team members Revenue River's at uh, right now, but you're a good sized agency. Um, you're in a leadership role there in the COO seat, someone who's kind of oriented towards the operational side of the businesses. What are the things that you wish that you knew earlier in the career, or kind of the, the key points that would have made that transition in that career path a little bit easier for you? Yeah, I think I think one thing I did right to give myself a little bit of credit is I spent a long time in understanding what it was like to work with clients, to be in the in on the digital marketing side of things. Um, I, I I feel like if I hadn't had that, I might make some decisions today that would take me in the wrong direction for from an operational standpoint. Maybe the right direction for ops, but not the right direction for our clients. So um, I think. If you, whatever operational role you're going to be in, especially in an agency world, spend some time on the ground floor, understanding what it's like to deal with clients, to be a part of those engagements. Maybe you don't have to be a strategist or a consultant necessarily, but really spend some time understanding what it's like to be the person facing clients every day. Um, because when you start to make decisions, I think one thing that has earned me some street credit a little bit is that I did spend a lot of time being the client facing person. And so when I make a recommendation, people trust it a little bit more than if I had never had that experience. Um, 
what didn't I, what, 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 what didn't I do that I would have, I would advise somebody newer in their career. Um, I, I honestly think that one of the people I've learned the most from it was a, was a Gart, former Gartner process engineer. So if I could advise anybody who wants to be an agency operations long-term to do anything, it would be go get your PMP or go and understand project management at a pretty deep level because that experience and learning that along the way has helped me to be much more effective than not having any of that background of, okay, what's the three-legged stool in project management? And how's that affect an agency's operations overall? That makes a lot of sense. Any specific examples of kind of where that, where those lessons have come into play or you know, even like, I mean, the specific story is always more exciting, but I guess kind of areas of what you do in the day-to-day where you feel the, the greatest impact from that. Um, I would say mostly, I, I would probably say the the most, the area I think that it, that it probably affects most is I, gosh, this is hard. I'm trying to think of <laughs> one, a specific example. Yeah. Um, I think that like it's simple, but scope management and how scope management plays into the entire process later on is such a huge element of an agency. I mean, I've seen it done ineffectively and then I've seen it done really effectively and and just having a really solid understanding of how you define a scope in a strong way helps me ensure that my sales team all the way down to the people executing on it are sort of speaking the same language, which I wouldn't have had that if I didn't get educated by a, a Gartner process right. engineer on that aspect. That's amazing. I'm glad that you brought out what you did well too, because that wasn't really the way I framed the question, but <laughs> I, I wanted both sides of it. And that ability to understand like, what are these people who I'm asking to do something actually living through uh, yeah. is huge. Both from, you mentioned the credibility and the, um, but also just from an internal like empathy and the, the perspective that gives you. Um, I'm sure that's been a, been a huge asset. This is the one tricky question for you. Not really tricky question, but are there, you mentioned using teamwork and some of the other platforms, you know, Airtable and some of the other platforms I use. Are there one or two uh, lesser known tools in the agency space that you use that are like either your secret weapons or tools you've been digging recently? Ooh, my lesser known tools that are are highly used um, or, or affect are used quite quite often. Um, I would say bug herd is one that, um, it creates so much efficiency for our web development process and just manages the flow of, of bugs. And, and it's a great client experience tool as well. They, they don't feel like they're having to log issues in a spreadsheet, which if you are an agency doing that, please stop. Like your clients have, can have better tools at a pretty low cost. Um, and then I would say, the uh, the other big efficiency tool or tool that I think is really valuable knowing where employee retention is headed in the next year is we use a tool called 15.5 to measure on a weekly basis what our team's pulse is like. And then the best feature or aspect about it, um, and we don't spend a lot on it. So it's not like a high investment culture amp type of thing, but it's it, get, it allows people to give each other high fives. And in a virtual world, being able to see each other, like give your teammate a high five and also see each other do it. Um, it's really cool. It's, it gives me visibility into the good things that people are doing. Cause a lot of times problems end up on my desk. Um, it's complaints and problems. So it's really nice to ha- just have that in my Slack feed and see that people are, are doing great things as well. They just wouldn't end up on my desk because it's, I, I'm the person who removes obstacles. That's awesome. Uh, both of those tools are really good. I've used bug herd, uh, in the past. Uh, there's another tool similarly called pastel, it's just use pastel.com. A Loki and his team in Toronto, um, are building that out and it's a, it's a pretty cool tool. They're newer than bug herd. So I don't know what feature to feature looks like right now. Um, but both of those get a lot of, uh, high marks from our client set. And then we use 15, five, uh, as well. And it's been, I mean, you, you kind of hit it. That piece has been, um, at, at first when we implemented it, I was like, I don't know, this is a little bit more formal than what we were doing previously. 
Um, but it's actually been super nice in the trends and reporting and stuff. There's actually a lot of good data being captured and centralized inside the tool, um, which is not the, you know, it's fundamental purpose is the human aspect and human touch and connection that you pointed out. Uh, but the data is also useful. So both of those tools are, we'll make sure they wind up in the show notes. Yeah. This has been awesome, Amber. Um, I appreciate you coming on, being willing to share. I know you've got a basketball practice to get to. Um, and we're talking about kids and, and uh, playing chauffeur, running people around. For folks who want to connect with you, obviously we'll, ch- we'll put the Revenue River site and everything else in. But anyone who wants to reach out or, um, or follow your journey, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, the best place to reach me is on LinkedIn, Amber Air Chemist. Um, so just search that. There's uh, not an, another one of me out there with that name. So you should be able to find me pretty quickly. Um, and you can always reach out to me via email as well at achemist at revriv.com. Awesome. We'll make sure both of those wind up in the show notes. Amber, thanks for coming on and sharing your journey with us today. Thanks for having me, Gray. It's been great.